Last week, we began to look at the life of Abraham, remembering the promise God made to him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the night sky, but how Sarah, at age 76, got impatient when that promise had still not been fulfilled and had Abraham sleep with her own handmaid, Hagar, in order to produce an heir. Then we jumped forward in time and found Abraham age 100 and Sarah age 90 when the three visitors, an early manifestation of the Trinity, arrived at their tent with the news that within a year's time, Sarah would bear the son who would at last fulfill God's promise to Abraham. Prior to their visit and in a passage not included in our lectionary readings, the scripture at Genesis 16 tells us that when Hagar became pregnant with the child that Sarah's scheme had made possible, relations between the two women changed. Hagar became proud and looked down on Sarah, and Sarah became insanely jealous of Hagar and treated her so badly that she fled, alone and pregnant, into the wilderness. There she was visited by an angel who told her, to return to the house of Abraham and Sarah, at least for the time being, he reassured her that she would bear a son whom she should name Ishmael, which means God hears. His descendants, like those of the son that would be born to Sarah, will be too numerous to count. After all, they too will be children of Abraham and the ancestors of all Arab people who trace their origins to Ishmael. Hagar is comforted and returns to the home of Abraham and Sarah. And it's there that we pick up today's reading from the lectionary text in Genesis 21. Sarah gives birth to a son who is named Isaac, meaning laughter, because Sarah had laughed when she overheard the three visitors telling Abraham that within a year she would bear a son. She was just too old for that. Isaac grows and is weaned, that took three or four years in the culture of that time, which means that by now Ishmael is in his late teens. Sarah sees that Ishmael is playing with Isaac. Perhaps he is mocking him. We aren't sure as the exact meaning of the Hebrew can be translated playing with or mocking or scoffing. At any rate, Sarah is upset. She feels that Ishmael, as the firstborn, could become a threat to Isaac's inheritance and demands that Abraham send Hagar and her child away. Naturally, this causes Abraham great distress. This is, after all, his firstborn son, whom he has known and loved for 16 or 17 years. But the Lord instructs him to give in to Sarah's demand because it is through Isaac that the promises will be fulfilled. However, he does tell Abraham that his firstborn, Ishmael, Hagar's son, will become a father of multitudes, just like Isaac. Here we see one of the many beautiful engravings that Gustave Doré made for an edition of the Bible that appeared in 1866. Using the most basic palette, black and white, Doré creates texture, contours, shadows, and the illusion of depth or distance, all depending on the direction of the lines and their density. We see the wonderfully sulky and angry expression on Sarah's face as she defensively hugs Isaac. We see the tear that Hagar sheds as she is forced to leave, and the pitiful sight of Ishmael clinging to his mother but stepping towards his father, not wanting to leave him. He doesn't look 16 or 17 here, but every illustration I've seen of Hagar and Ishmael shows him either as a toddler or a young child. So I guess we have to grant artistic license. So Hagar sets out, equipped with only a skin of water and some food given her by Abraham, and she begins to wander in the desert of Beersheba. Soon the water and food are gone, and she grows desperate. She leaves Ishmael in the shade of a bush and moves away. She can't bear to see the boy die of hunger and thirst, and she begins to cry. 
Doré, in another engraving, imagined the scene this way, with Hagar throwing her head back in despair, arms extended beseechingly towards heaven. The dark rocks loom menacingly above and around her. A water jar lies abandoned in the foreground, and Ishmael is stretched out lifelessly on the sand. Now, for the second time in her life, an angel appears to comfort Hagar. And this is worthy of note. Not many people in the Bible receive one angelic visitation, let alone two. And here the scripture gets really interesting. But before we go into that, I want to take a look at a moving rendition of this scene by the French painter Camille Corot. Corot was influenced by the Barbizon school of painters that we discussed in an earlier issue of this series. He too frequently made a pilgrimage to the forest of Fontainebleau to paint scenes of nature he found there and to enjoy the nearby town of Barbizon, which gave its name to this artistic movement. Corot is a much loved and much collected artist from this period particularly amongst Americans. His style was very popular and frequently imitated. He even encouraged his students to copy his own work and was often known to sign these works by his students with his own name. So there are quite a few fake Corots out there. It's said that Corot painted 3,000 canvases, 10,000 of which are in America. But this is one of his earlier works, and it was so acclaimed at the time he first exhibited it that we know it's the genuine article. And we can also see how he gained his inspiration. For the large tree in the background and the ravine beside it, he turned to a landscape scene he had painted two or three years before when visiting Fontainebleau. Here are the two works side by side and you can see the similarity. He also made several trips to study the art and landscape of Italy, which inspired the colors and contours of the scene for the painting we're considering. You see a painting of the citadel at Volterra on the upper left, and of the remains of a Roman aqueduct on the right. Here you see all three of the elements that went into his painting. The result is this rather classical uh, study of Hagar and Ishmael in the wilderness, about to be comforted by the words of an angel approaching high above. I say classical because he is still close to the work of the great classical landscape tradition of the past particularly embodied in Nicolas Poussin, whose carefully structured, highly idealized landscapes usually were the impressive backdrop for a scene from history, myth, or the Bible. Here we see St. John in exile on the island of Patmos. The carefully crafted landscape is really the star of the painting. Not so much the figure of St. John, who serves rather as a pretext for the creation of a magnificent landscape rather than as the subject of the painting itself. Coho is operating within that centuries-old classical tradition. The landscape here is purely imaginary, a composite of images from places and scenes that have inspired him in the past and into which he places the figures of Hagar, Ishmael, and the approaching angel. And all of this work was meticulously done back in the artist's studio, not outside, not en plein air, not drawing spontaneous inspiration from the natural world. But let's return to this extraordinary scene at is, as it is given to us in scripture. We read, God heard, or God has heard, twice which is a pun on the name Ishmael, which, as we said, means God hears or has heard. And whom has he heard? Strangely enough, it's not Hagar, who we are told had been crying out, 
but it's Ishmael. And up to this point, we didn't even know he had said anything at all. Now think about that. Ishmael is just a teenager and one who has been cast out of his own home with God's consent. He's the son of a slave woman, and although a child of Abraham, he's not the one who will inherit all God's promises. You would almost expect him to have been written out of the story by this time, because he's not one of the main characters, so to speak. But scripture very carefully places our attention on this outcast young boy called Ishmael, God hears, whose voice God does hear amongst all the other clamoring, praying, pleading, desperate voices arising from earth every second of every day. And although Ishmael does largely disappear from our eyes and from the biblical narrative, we only meet him again when he comes together with Isaac to bury Abraham, scripture tells us in verse 20 that God was with him as he grew up. I just find that verse, God was with the boy as he grew up, so reassuring, so moving. Nothing, nobody, is ever outside of the care and presence of God. Not you, not me, not the outcast, not the stranger, not the son of a slave, nobody. God is always with us, even in our own personal desert or wilderness which allows me to make a brief reference to the gospel lectionary text for today. In it, Jesus is sending out his 12 disciples, and he's telling them just how hard it is going to be for them out in the world. They will be persecuted and betrayed. Brother will be against brother. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. They will be handed over to local councils, to governors, to kings who will have them flogged and sometimes put to death. They'll be hated just as Jesus has been hated. Needless to say, this is not your average pep talk or recruiting pitch. But he also tells them, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Just as his eye is on Ishmael, so his eye is on the sparrow, as the song puts it. Which puts me in mind of my favorite painting of a small bird, my favorite in all the world, not quite a sparrow, but a close relative, a goldfinch, a member of what I call the little brown bird family, since I'm not much good at identifying birds. I made a special pilgrimage to see the goldfinch at the Moritz house at The Hague several years ago. Thanks to Donna Tott Tart's novel of the same name, the goldfish was all the, ra the rage, and it even bumped Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring from her number one place in the popularity charts. It was created in 1654 by Carol Fabritius. This is his self-portrait from two years earlier. He was a Dutch artist who studied under Rembrandt in Amsterdam, but then moved to Delft to open up a studio and start his career. Delft is seen here in the famous painting by Vermeer. Fabritius was tragically killed at a very young age by an explosion at a nearby storage dump for gunpowder. The aftermath is captured in this painting of the blasted, smoking city, with the wounded and dead being carried away from the scene. The goldfinch was one of the last paintings Fabritius did. And it's a miracle it survived, as most of Fabritius's work was destroyed during the explosion and ensuing fire. It's a very small work, 13 by 9 inches, 
and you can tell that it was meant to be mounted high up so that the viewer looks up at it. The Dutch at that time sometimes kept pet birds on a small chain perched on a feed box, as we see here, and Fabritius has created an illusionistic image of that. The technique is called trompe l'oeil, which is French for fool the eye, and it's so convincing that the eye indeed might be fooled into thinking that it was looking at a real live bird. The texture of the wall and the shadow cast by the bird upon it are both beautifully realized, and the bird itself is created with a loose brush rather than with fine meticulous strokes because the eye at a distance does not see individual feathers, but a soft, slightly blurred fluffiness, which is exactly the effect Fabritius sought to achieve, as if the bird had just fluttered its feathers. He even borrowed a favorite trick of Rembrandt's when painting the yellow splash on the bird's wing. He used the wooden end of his brush to dig into the paint to create the little black mark in the midst of the yellow blaze. But the fact that the brush strokes are loose and the technique rapid does not mean that the utmost care was not taken with this painting. It shows all the love, care, and attention that is normally lavished on a major portrait. Great care was taken with the gold chain, which is, in fact, painted rather meticulously because it is not alive and breathing. It is humanly manufactured. The bird is purposely given a slightly blurrier treatment because that is precisely what gives it life and vitality when seen from below and at a slight distance. And the sparkle in the bird's little eye is absolutely fabulous and glitters with life. It makes you wonder why the painter went to such extraordinary lengths to paint what is, in fact, a portrait of a bird. And you wonder about that very carefully painted gold chain. I don't know about you, but I don't find this image a particularly happy or joyous one, although it is one of my favorite paintings. The delicately chained bird makes me rather sad. Birds are meant to be free. And it seems a pity that a winged creature should be made to spend the majority of its life chained and unable to fly. Lavishing so much attention, even love, on such an apparently insignificant subject may have been the artist's way to identify himself with all creatures who are chained or bound for whatever reason, and to confer on them the dignity that is inherently theirs. As Jesus said, not one of these little creatures will fall to the ground without the Lord's knowledge and attention. His eye is on the sparrow, on the goldfinch, it's on the immigrant or the outcast son of a slave dying of thirst in the wilderness, and it's on you and me. And because his eye is on us, we don't need to be afraid.